this proposed budget. And then uh, we will have the board ask questions about any part of the budget that they uh, wish to discuss further. And then we'll take comments from um, people from the audience. Um, the, the meeting tonight will be chaired by Peter Leslie, who is our finance chairman. So I'll turn the meeting over to Peter now. Thank you, Jan. And I will turn the meeting over to Sue Weatherby, who will uh, describe the community services proposed budget. Sue? Thank you, Peter. I realize it's probably risky business to be giving you a, a red budget, but um, the print is still black, so um, we should be okay. As you review the community services budget, um, I would like you to keep in mind not only the number and variety of programs and services that we provide, but more importantly, the number of citizens that is impacted by community services. Our audiences encompass infants to senior citizens with vast ranges of interest and incomes. In tough budget times, we struggle to keep our programs cost effective yet affordable. Families are having to make difficult choices in regards to their recreation and leisure time activities. In spite of those choices, or in spite of the recession, our program success rate this past fall um, was the highest um, success rate that we have had in a number of years. They say when we go to national conventions, if, if you're operating at about um, a, more than an 85% success rate, <coughs> you're not taking enough risk. And um, so we offered more programs, and in the past we've been anywhere from 88 to 90% in terms of our success rate with classes. Um, but this past fall, um, for some reason, whether ours are more cost effective than others or people were looking to stay closer to home or, or, or for whatever reason, um, they chose to spend their uh, recreational leisure time dollars um, on community services programs here in Cape Elizabeth. We offered a total of um, 120 three programs and we had su sufficient enrollment in 118 of those programs yielding a success rate of 96 percent and I have given you a, a fall 91 program statistic handout that really um, shows you exactly what classes didn't go um, how the youth classes did as compared to the adult classes um, how many classes in fact reached maximum enrollment which was 45 of the 123 um, and down at the bottom I made a notation that we had 113 people on waiting lists so this gives you a, a pretty good idea of, of how things um, went um, in the fall program I am seeing at this point that we're, we're beginning to see a little bit of the impact of the recession in our spring semester I don't have all of those statistics available because things are still going on and still starting um, my guess is that we'll probably be back to where we have been in the past, and that is about at 88% um, success rate. Community services continues to respond to citizen interest and demands by, one, offering affordable quality programs and activities, two, expanding more daytime offerings utilizing the 1226 Shore Road facility, and the town council gave us that facility to use for our programming on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. And on Tuesdays, I believe we have three classes going all at the same time there, so we are making good use of that, that facility. Um, optimizing use of the community pool by developing more adult and youth programs during downtime hours. A couple of the new things that we have offered this fall is um, both a master swim program um, and we're up to about 35 members of, of our master swim program and we hosted our first swim meet a couple of Sundays ago and um, we had people competing from age 18 to age 78 um, in our pool and that, that occurred on a Sunday morning which is, is, has been downtime in the pool in the past. We also have um, started to offer Saturday night programming for 6th through 8th graders one Saturday night a month called pool games that 
is getting off to a slow start, but with some more publicity and by word of mouth, um, we hope that that um, participation will increase there. Altering and expanding ski program options for third through 10th grade students as not to interfere with the weekday academic schedules. This year, um, we altered our ski program. Uh, feedback from parents, school administrators, teachers, and so forth was that by going on Thursdays, leaving at 4 o'clock, getting back at 9.30, um, the kids were basically geared up the day of and exhausted the day after, and it definitely seemed to be affecting um, their academic performance and preparation for classes. So we opted to go to Sunday River for that age group this year, and we have been going um, on five Saturdays. We basically leave at 6.30, quarter seven in the morning. We get back at six o'clock at night. The children are able to have um, a 75 minute lesson um, and then free ski the rest of the day. And we're presently taking about 95 children um, each Saturday and that seems to be going very well. For the younger children, we decided to leave um, Lost Valley and take them to Shawnee Peak. And uh, we decided to begin that with age three. So we basically dropped grades one and two. We did grades one and two to Lost Valley for two years. Um, it was quite a challenge taking first and second graders. Um, it was necessary to keep them in lessons the entire time where we couldn't set them free on, on the slopes because of um, their ability, number one, and uh, to ski as well as find their way around. So we opted to start with third graders this year, and we did. So we're offering third through sixth graders trips to Shawnee Peak on the half-day workshop days. And we've gone twice, and uh, we'll be going again in March, March 18th, the next workshop day. And I think that's worked very well. Actually, they're getting as much ski time as they got when we went six times. Uh, because we're spending much more time there. So it's cost effective because we don't have to travel back and forth um, as many times and, and yet the kids are getting as much time on the mountain. And that program filled the capacity as well. We're taking about 80 uh, third through sixth graders there. Increase opportunities for senior citizens in both programming and in travel. Um, our senior citizen club seems to just grow and grow and I think the the demographic trends are exactly what they said they were going to be, more senior citizens um, in the 90s. And uh, we've seen a great change in, in um, our senior citizen group in that it is much younger, um, it is much more active, they're wanting to do more things and to go more places. And we're um, going on a four-day trip to Amish co co uh, country in Pennsylvania in April and um, we anticipate that that will be filled to capacity. But they just seem to want to do more and more. As you review the budget, please be aware of two very important facts. The anticipated state subsidy has been reduced by 25%, um, approximately 40,000 to 30,000. Um, and I say approximate. They, in fact, say we're going to get a little more than 30, but I'm not betting on it. So we are... Um, counting on about 30,000. And the carry forward balance from FY92 is anticipated to be um, between eight and 9,000 as compared to 35,000 that we had a year ago carrying into this year's budget. Over a period of five years, the community services budget has grown from slightly over 300,000 to a request of nearly 520,000 um, for FY93 even though our budget calls for an increase of a total of around 42,000 over last year's budget, and even though our state subsidy has been decreased um, by 10,000, and our carried forward balance is 27,000 less than the previous year, the, con the town contribution is slightly less. In difficult budget times, it makes sense to compare program costs and services with our neighboring comparable communities. I did a recent survey of the communities listed um, here, and um, I would just like to um, explain it to you. 
in this, in this um, survey, I, I really tried to compare apples to apples. Um, if they had other expenses in their budget that we didn't have, um, some of them do a little bit of work um, as far as lining fields and, and doing some work with the parks. We eliminated that cost from their budget. So we really did try to compare apples to apples. And as you see, in fact, it ranges from 45% of the total budget being the town contribution down to 17.9%, which is what Cape Elizabeth's um, percent of, of um, total dollars um, is in terms of our total budget. And I think that's a fairly significant um, comparison. I think <coughs> people in Cape Elizabeth really are getting a lot um, for their appropriation to community services. In the area of recreation and adult education, Cape Elizabeth's one town concept is not only most effective, but most efficient as well. One department for both areas fosters cooperation where two can create competition. One department provides for one central scheduling unit as well as a clearinghouse for all community activities. Most other communities have abandoned the community services concept of having one department for both recreation and adult ed resulting in separate budgets, separate directors, different staffing, and separate brochures. The Cape Elizabeth program is unique in, it, in that it allows for flexibility, creativity, and expansion of programming. Of the town survey, we were the only community program that provides a senior citizen organization, an after school enrichment program, scheduling of school facilities, a community pool, week-long enrichment camps for that adolescent population of 6th through 10th grade students, and with Scarborough, the only community that also offers an extended school care program. Sue, let me interrupt you if I may sure. for a minute. Uh, when you did this survey, did you discover any services that any other towns were offering that we were not? Um, some of them do some work with um, parks, um, either with the playground part of the park or lining of fields, etc. Well, I and guess, per, but the, those services are provided by other parts of our town, aren't they, or? Yes, those services are provided by our public works department. Um, I was thinking of courses, uh, services <laughs> that we were not providing that they were. Scarborough does um, community services oversees the cable television, um, and that's one thing that they do that we don't. But other than that, um, I don't know of any. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes, Since we had a break for a comment, may I ask for a clarification? Sure. On your comment about 17.9% uh, of the budget, mm -hmm. uh, you meant of the community services budget. Correct. Right, I'm sorry. Of our budget, yes. And um, also, I think that it's important to note but that returns 458%. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's important. And how many of these towns had a surplus, do you know? I didn't ask that question, so I don't know. I can't say for sure. Thank you. You don't mind if we interrupt you along the way? Absolutely okay. not. Because that's what format we have been following, so I feel free to. to I figured if I went <laughs> real fast, you wouldn't have an opportunity to interrupt me at all. You've got another three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> of our total, um, our total budget far exceeds that of other communities. <coughs> However, our town appropriation is the lowest percentage, 17.9% of 48 communities responding to a 1991-92 budget survey conducted by the Parks and Recreation Division Office of Comprehensive Planning. And I did put that report in, looks like this. This doesn't necessarily compare apples to apples, and that's why I did the survey that I did. In fact, with the other communities, because they don't have just a community services budget, they have an adult ed budget and a recreational budget. This basically reflects only their recreational budget. Um, so in fact, their appropriation as the percent of the, the total budget um, wouldn't be accurate in terms of both adult ed and recreation. But I did want you to see that these other communities were in fact, um, compared to with what we do, and um, we are the lowest percentage of those 48 that responded to this survey. Cape Elizabeth residents are getting 
a bargain for their tax dollars appropriated to community services when you consider that they are receiving over a half million dollars worth of services for a, for a mere 14.5 cents on the tax rate or 84,000 which is 16.15 of the total community services budget. I urge you to continue your support and endorsement of these important programs for the community. Cutting any of these services would in fact cut our revenues. The programs that are not self-sustaining are services that we should strive to continue, such as the pool, senior citizen programs, discounts, and scholarships availability. Also our services to other community groups. Contained in the, in the budget pages is a detail of um, our anticipated FY93 revenues, as well as a delineation of all expenditures by program. In order to clarify differentials from the FY92 budget into this FY93 budget, I have identified some of the substantial increases and decreases um, in the areas to follow. Uh, at this point, since we're going to compare revenues, I would recommend that you turn to page four, which is the beginning of your detailed um, revenues for um, both 92 and 93. Now, rather than go down these line by okay. line, why don't we ask if there are any questions now? But if you want some comments to precede those, okay. go ahead and make them. Why don't I give you um, the things that, that I have brought to attention that Good. have, have um, major differences from one year into the next? And then if you would like further explanation on them, I'd be glad to give it. State subsidy, which we already mentioned in the narrative part, um, has a reduction of $10,000. Um, but I anticipate that our revenues in adult ed will be an increase of $10,000. And I have a printout as to where we stand right now as of February 29th in our revenues. And in our adult ed fees, we've already taken in $42,700 this year. And that's what I'm basically um, predicting for next year. So this is a very realistic um, figure. Um, I also might add that most of our adult ed fees are in for the year. We may have a little bit uh, piddle in for the remainder of the year, but basically um, most of those revenues are in at this time. So that's adult ed. Do you have any questions on the adult ed portion of the revenues? There really isn't anything else that's very significant. Okay, moving along to aquatics. Um, I see an increase in our fees for the pool and, and the major reason for that would be the addition of the master swim program, which we believe will generate um, around $2,400 next year. So you mean when you say increased fees, you mean revenue, not increased fees right. for usage? Right. Okay. Increase the revenue in the pool account. Uh, on aquatics, it looks like you have an increase in revenues of 2,400. Then on the expenditure side, mm -hmm. 5,200 as a uh, director's salary, and then two more, say positive uh, expense items decreases. In other words, of about 2,700 dollars. Mm -hmm. So the the last two on the expenditure side and the first on the revenue side pretty much balance each other out. They do. And then you, you have the 5200 restructuring of the position. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that a little more? It looks like that program is all of a sudden costing a lot more money. Okay. Um, it is in some respects because we went from a part-time aquatics director when Don Richards left, which was, was almost intended to be a stipend position. Um, we hired someone that would spend um, designated hours at the pool, specified hours. Um, we found that, that the pool needed to have more supervision and needed to have someone um, in authority there more hours of the day. So we did restructure that position. Uh, some of that money went into the aquatics director's position, but we also reduced some of the staff position because since the aquatics director was going to be there, we wouldn't need as much staff. So we did pull a little bit from that as well. 
So yes, you know, because we restructured the position, we are spending more money. Is aquatics uh, a uh, still one that uh, program that generates a surplus? Oh no, swimming pools never generate a surplus. Um, in fact, that's the biggest deficit we have in all of our programs is with the pool, and that runs at about a twenty-eight thousand dollar deficit a year, which is less than. But that includes operating costs. Does some it? operating costs. Okay. Well, X operating costs. I was mm -hmm. thinking we have the pool. That's correct. I was thinking of just the marginal cost since we have the pool for our school mm -hmm. athletic program. Um, it's probably right here, but just tell me. Uh, leaving aside the operating costs, is it still subsidized as a community service activity? Yes. But much less than 28000 No. All 28000 is subsidized. Okay. Thank you. Summer program revenues. Um, we anticipate an increase in day camp revenues of, of $9,000, and that is based on last year's <coughs> revenue, um, as well as a slight increase in the day camp um, tuition for this summer. And the capability camp registration, um, we anticipate an increase of $15,000 in revenues, and that's just because of the growth of our capability camps, um, which are self-sustaining. What we take in, we spend. So that um, the program revenues um, will be offset by program expenditures. But we, we look at those camp by camp, and um, sometimes we borrow from Peter to pay Paul, but the, the bottom line is is basically um, one of self-supporting self self -supporting, um, camps. Extended school care, um, we anticipate an in, in increase in revenues um, for next year of about $40,000, and that is based on where we are at this point this year. Um, we still have four more months of um, tuition fees to collect and at, at this point, so actually four and a half more months, and at this point we're collecting about $13,000 a month in tuition. So we anticipate that we'll be collecting um, probably another fifty to 55000 um, before the end of the year, which will put us um, well over what we predicted for revenues this year. So that's the revenue side of the budget. In expenditures, which starts on um, page six, I haven't indicated any change in administration. Um, in fact, if you refer from what we spent in FY92 to FY93, you'll notice that that the figures are somewhat more. One of the reasons for that is that um, last year two administrators received one-time salary adjustments um, in regards to the benefit the saga. So what was in the budget isn't what we were actually paid. We were paid actually a little more after the adjustments. Um, and I think that's fairly similar to what occurred in the, in the school budget. And also, um, I have built into salaries um, anywhere from a 3 to 5 percent um, increase, and that's due to an anticipated restructuring of the community services staff. And um, I anticipate with the increase of responsibilities that we will probably be redesigning some positions, including um, increasing hours, and um, we may in fact have to um, <coughs> hire additional staff. So that's why there are some differences in, in the administration salary accounts. In adult education. I'd just like to comment on that. It would not be surprising when you see such an enormous increase in revenue to have to have a somewhat larger payroll to support that. And is that what you're getting at? 
Well, I just think from the public point of view, it might be might be a good idea to clarify that. I think what I'm getting at, Peter, is that um, we've been asked to undertake some new responsibilities for next year. We're not sure what that is going to entail in, in terms of our staff time. Um, in community services, we've always tried to utilize the interest and talents of, of our staff, and, and there's been an, a lot of overlapping with the parameters of some of the positions. And um, we are going to sit down as a staff and, and we are going to rewrite some of the job descriptions um, depending upon their, their interest um, in some of these new positions. And that's why I put some money in there thinking that um, we may have to increase hours or we may have to, in, in fact, change someone's job from what they're doing presently to what they might be doing next year. I would just, this is the part that I was talking about earlier. We were talking about restructuring the assignment of some of our maintenance, custodial, and transportation functions, trying to pick up on how we utilize community services to centralize use of the buildings. Can we go further and centralize use of how we assign people to clean the buildings, maintain them? Uh, community services is already dealing with a good deal of that in the sense of, of uh, use of the buildings at uh, varieties, uh, a variety of times, weekend as well as uh, after school hours and so on. Um, this is also part of an attempt to deal with a kind of upgrading of quality programming. And um, I've explained that we didn't, I did not put a specific sum in the school budget tag that, but I explained that I had discussed that with Sue and that I wanted to make sure that there was money available here. As we go through this process, we may find, for instance, that we streamline some of our operations and there's money available there, too. And we will certainly keep you updated as to what our recommendations are, but we wanted to be sure we had some parameters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. In the area of um, adult education, our instructor payroll, um, we um, anticipate will be up $5,000, and, and that's really proportional to the growth um, in the number of programs. Benefits for our adult ed teachers um, increases um, proportional to the to the um, instruction, and also we have um, added dental benefits for the full time um, staff people. High school diploma and GED. Um, although our demand in the past has not been great, and we're no longer a testing site because of um, the number of tests we, we actually give each year, the demand for tutoring has become much greater. In fact, we've just about exceeded the entire amount that we had allocated for this year, so I have um, put another $500 into the budget for next year, and that's 75% reimbursable from um, the state. In aquatics, um, the director's salary actually is an increase of, of 5200 and that's due to the restructuring of, of the position. Just for your clarification, the right now, and, and as I say, when we restructure our office staff um, this summer, um, but as of right now, in order to um, find someone that I felt was acceptable as, as an aquatics director, um, this individual was looking for full-time employment and I had the opportunity to really fill two positions when Carrie Curtis, our aquatics director, came on board. Don Richards was leaving as aquatics director and Alan White was, was leaving as our evening supervisor. So what we did was we took the two positions and we combined them to make a full-time position for Carrie. So um, he wears many hats. He, he could be there in the capacity of the aquatics director or um, just a, a pool staff person replacing one of the lifeguards that we would have during the week in the evening, um, or he could um, be on <coughs> duty in the capacity of our night supervisor. So he does work a, a 40 hour week with us. Training, um, we have decreased that account, and that's because um, Kerry is sort certified and he is doing much of the the training himself right on site, so we're not having to send people off to, to recertify. And in fact, he is teaching our, 
our lifeguarding certification classes, our standard first aid, our CPR classes, and all of that, so we're able to utilize him in that capacity as well. Our supply account, we have decreased by $2,200, and um, that is because, frankly, we were overstocked. Um, there was a lot of stuff downstairs in the basement of the pool that we, in fact, didn't even know was there. And um, they are um, administering the chemicals a little bit differently now, where carries in, in the facility most of the time, and, and that has been um, cost effective as well. So that is um, the aquatics account. Questions? Okay. Summer program supply, the increase of $8,200, and um, I think that basically was in the supply account of the summer program, and that was we finally put things where they belonged um, in the budget in terms of supplies, um, purchasing the food, for our adventure camps and so forth had not we had always paid a contracted fee now that is all um, within our supply account of the summer program budget but that will certainly be covered with the revenues we take in for those individual camps under other programs under payroll the bus driver salary for the Sunday River trips um, is increased to twenty six hundred and twenty five dollars and that was the only significant change there. <coughs> and extended school care, and um, that's a payroll increase of 12500 and that was additional staff added due to increased enrollment. Right now, we have an average daily attendance um, of about 90 students in um, the extended daycare program, and because um, we are mandated by the state guidelines in terms of being licensed by the State Department, we have to maintain a 1 to 10 ratio. ratio. So we have nine staff people on duty each afternoon in, in that program. Are you turning anybody away? We aren't at this point. We maintained a waiting list earlier in the year, but with people's schedule changes and so forth, we have been able to accommodate everyone who wishes to be in both in the kindergarten program um, and in the at before and after school program. Do you have a maximum on the kindergarten program? We do, 20 in each session. So that would be 20 in the morning, or 20, actually in the afternoon session, I think, Charlie, we have 21 enrolled. Um, they don't all come all five days. Um, the minimum that they can come is three. So we have to maintain a ratio of that one to 10, and we have two staff people. So it's basically about 20 per day in both the morning and the afternoon session. Is that the minimum they can come or the maximum? Minimum they can come. I'm sorry, did I say max? No, no, you said minimum. minimum. I just didn't understand. They have to come at least three days a week in order to be in the program. They come either three, four, or five days. I just wondered how you managed to comply with the mandate when you had 21 if you were just counting on one not showing up every single day. Well, some of them are only in for three days. So on, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we may have 20 enrolled in the program. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's no. the answer. But um, we have 21, and we always seem to have around 19 there or 20 there. So it's, it's sort of overbooked because not everybody will show on the same day. Well, it hasn't happened, so. See, well, then you could do what the airlines do, have a volunteer. No, that's when they come and spend time in my office. <laughs> I just want to make sure we're complying. Okay. We're not playing Russian roulette with the attendance. So that's basically all I have. Um, in summary, as, as you consider this budget, um, I hope that you will consider the powerful presence of community services in this town, not only with our own programs, but also um, as an integral part of the school <coughs> system. Each year, our programs and services expand, enhancing the quality of life for all citizens. Once again, I look forward to your support of our programs. Thank still, you, Sue. Excuse me. I still have a question on extended school care. Um, right now, you have about 90 students total in your program. 90 in the afternoon program. Okay. Okay. We have another um, probably 40 in the morning program. And some of those could be duplications. Some of them mm. are different. And then another basically about another 40 kindergarten students and some of there's some overlap there too there's some duplication there 
Okay, you have projected revenue increases. Is mm -hmm. there a fee uh, increase in your fees? There is a small increase in the fees for next year, yes. Rosemary? Um, so did you consider your capability camp revenues on 6th through 10th grade? <coughs> yes, we did. Okay. And do you have any provision uh, or do you have an agreement with the town about uh, a proportionate uh, share of the expenses of, at 1226? We don't at this time. I know that in, in terms of furnishing the building, um, they took the surplus that I turned back to the town last year and allowed um, Debbie Pizzo and I to purchase all of the furnishings that are in the house. So I guess at that point, that's been our contribution to date, um, would be the furnishings. Okay, I just thought since you asked for three, you have use of the building for three days. Yes. That it might be something that we want to consider um, somewhere. But since they get all the uh, revenue that's left over at the end of the year, the surplus, mm -hmm. then maybe that would cover it. But I just thought if we, there was some discussion about that with the town officials. Uh, also, people have asked me about driver education and why we don't offer it. I'm sure there's a reason I just don't. We have. In fact, we did two years ago as part of our, our capability camps. And in fact, we're hoping to do it this year. It doesn't really fit into capability camps because most of our campus are sixth through ninth graders. And with the, within the increase in the age uh, for taking driver ed and getting your license, it's probably uh, more applicable for kids that are at least freshmen or sophomores. So we are hoping to be able to contract with a local agency to come out here and teach in Cape Elizabeth. But that, that is on the docket for summer if we can secure someone to come out and teach it. Thank you. Shane, you had a question? Yes, thanks. Um, since Extended Day uses your facility as well, is there any plan on your part to, to improve the playground that's there since that's an issue for the incoming kindergartners as well? We hope to be able to um, save some of the money that is in this current year's budget um, to purchase some more playground um, apparatus. Um, I think it's the intent of, of the nursery school program to do the same at the end of their year. If they have any money, that was the agreement we had with them last year. Um, at this point, we have contracted with someone to construct a huge sandbox down there. Um, and that's going to happen, and we hope to, to it, add at least one more piece of equipment. As a follow-up to that, um, the Capability camps and the uh, many of the other programs use the um, phys ed equipment mm -hmm. and things of that nature, the soccer balls and basketballs. Do you? They don't. We use some of, we don't use their balls and, and that kind of equipment as such, but we do use um, things like archery targets, volleyball standards, and nets, things that are there in the building. And, um, why don't you continue with your question? My, my question is, is there anything in your budget that allows them uh, the money or anything to replace what proportionally might be worn out because of the use of community <laughs> services? Um, this year I have met with the, the phys ed staff um, and um, they were concerned about those same things. And what it is is general use of the buildings by the community and we are we have been collecting rental fees for um, the community at large to use the buildings on weekends and in the past that money had gone back into a general fund and i went to connie and i asked if we might put it into a fund to replace repair um, equipment because of of, of general use um, and she said that she thought that that was appropriate and we now have that account set up. Um, it's not going to be restricted only to physical education. It could be something done um, <coughs> in connection with our use of the auditorium and the stage, with our use of um, computers. Um, we've already bought some graphic arts things for uh, Gary Lenoy and I think, you know, all of those kinds of things is, is what this fund will be intended for. And I think that if we, you know, share our resources, that um, everyone will benefit, and that's what we intend to do. And I have one more. Okay. Um, in the discussions earlier, 
this week and last. Uh, we talked about the uh, elimination of the life skills health program at the uh, middle school and a reduction in the lab size. Mm -hmm. And you currently offer programs there. And uh, Frank Miles discussed the use of the current home ec room at the high school for the photo lab. What do the elimination of those spaces currently being used by community services do to any of your program name, if anything? Um, the elimination of a kitchen is, is a great concern to me because cooking classes for our adult ed courses are probably our most successful classes. They operate at a hundred percent success rate with um, waiting lists um, all the time. So yes, not having a kitchen where we can conduct those classes is of great concern. Um, Frank and I have talked, we've even um, surveyed some <coughs> possible locations um, within the high school that we could set up a kitchen. Um, all of the appliances are going to be available as is counter space, um, as <coughs> will cabinets. And there are several places that we are investigating um, in the high school to be able to set up um, a kitchen facility. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the after school adventures are phenomenal and successful. Are, are you thinking of extending those programs? at all or extending. I, I know uh, there were several little girls who were upset that the cooking class the first grade was, was full. We thought of having maybe two, two sessions of those real popular classes? Or? Well, I think we always look to expand um, on things that are successful. Um, an example of, this, of that is this year we expanded to doing some things for kindergarten students and for first grade students. And um, as you said, that they, they were very um, successful. Kids, not everybody got in, and, and people do want us to be doing more. And yes, if we can secure instructors, and yes, if we have a facility to conduct those classes, we certainly will expand them. And um, have you given any thought to offering programs during the vacation week? Whatever I'm looking for. Um, it's been suggested. And um, we have given it some thought. In fact, um, we were going to call them vacation or vac camps. And um, we were thinking, thinking of even doing some sport camps during the vacation. Um, none of them are a reality at this point, but I think that there seems to be more and more pressure on us to offer something during the vacation periods. Um, at this time, it seems to be our only down, down time of the year, however. And, and you probably um, enjoy having a little downtime. But I, I, I think there's a need out there, and I think that is something that we could look towards um, in the future. Charlie. I have one more question. I'm back on extended school care. Okay. Only because are our fees compa compatible or compatible <coughs> with the market that's out there as far as that kind of thing? Um, actually, they're, they're far less than, than what they're uh, charging in the private sector. Okay. And I think that one reason for that is um, our overhead costs are low because we use the school facility and also we're covered by um, the school liability insurance, um, which is a reason for having much higher costs in, in the private sector. So they're, they're far cheaper. Okay. Then so, I will, excuse me. Yeah. Then I will take. Then I will take what you make over expenses and what you project for next year as a as a blessing in disguise. Um, do you want to know how much? You no, make? I know. I figured it out. Okay. You this year you'll make about twenty eight thousand over expenses. Next year you project about fifty three thousand. Since it's such a dramatic uh, increase in in um, uh, revenue over expenses, I just want to make sure that we aren't. We aren't, and I think it is because um, we're utilizing um, a lot of the stuff in that budget if we had to go outright, uh, buy it outright and so forth. Um, the cost of the program would be much more expensive, but we're sharing resources with what we get for summer program, what we use in after school adventure programs. Um, the equipment we're not having to duplicate. What we use in summer we use during the school year, and that's why we can make it cost effective and affordable. Um, we also, I try to build administrative time into that account. Um, I'm not sure the administrative time that we build in 
um, is really reflected in the cost of the program. It's far greater than I think what we actually budget in, in, in terms of our time and so forth. And I think that's why it looks inflated that we make a profit. And in fact, we probably do make some and it helps to offset some of the programs um, that we are able to offer because we can borrow from one that's and put said, it towards the other. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. It's the only program that uh, actually makes money by this accounting measure. All the rest are subsidized. <coughs> so really it's this program plus the town and state subsidy that subsidize all the other activities. And as long as you're pricing this uh, competitively, uh, as you say, more than competitively, uh, providing the service at a lower rate than comparable uh, institutions, uh, it would seem difficult for anybody to complain about that. But it is unusual that it is the, the only one that Makes a substantial makes, profit. Makes profit by this accounting. Yes, yeah, yes, I think yes. it's important to add that because <laughs> it is, as you point out, free space uh, and our insurance. So big numbers. Uh, okay, Sue, at this point, uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for your usual fine presentation and uh, clear presentation. Uh, did you want to go on and, and say some more, draw our attention to anything else, or should? Uh, um, I just included one more handout in your packet, and um, this was requested so that um, you could see actually what parents are spending at the, the younger grade levels for their children to participate in um, athletic, well, not even necessarily <coughs> athletic programs, but um, programs that their children are enrolled in outside of the, the school day. Mm -hmm. I have three questions. <clears throat> One is a comment about that. I requested that sheet from Sue, and I would ask that you please keep it for future reference because that is in part the basis on my um, request that we discuss the uh, equipment fee for uh, middle school and high school athletics. Also, uh, to see uh, really what a deal our uh, participants are getting in this. On the um, daycare, situation, I think it's important to note that we have no out-of-town uh, children in that program. That's correct. They're all Cape uh, residents. We children. have um, one staff child um, who live out of district, but that's it. I'll accept that. Okay. Uh, the other thing, so in your budget, uh, in one of your uh, adult activities, there's a cost to provide one of the programs that isn't free space. And that is uh, you pay rent to a South Portland facility. That's correct. Um, one of the things that I would like to enter into the discussion here is uh, the superintendent had pr uh, proposed to us earlier about the changes that had to be done at the high school, uh, included a multi-purpose room that would be partly used for the uh, kindergarten partly used for community services. Could you tell me if this multi-purpose room became available, if the savings in rent that you pay to that other facility um, could be transferred to um, Cape Elizabeth property? And could you give me approximately what that annual cost is? Right now we're, we're paying approximately $3,000 to rent space for our aerobics classes. Um, in the past until this year we were spending additional monies to rent other spaces but now that we're using 1226 Shore Road we're not having to do that. Certainly that um, $3,000 a year is not going to pay to build that multi-purpose room. I can tell you that I think it would be well utilized by a number of different populations. Um, it would serve as, as gym space for, for the kindergarten physical education program. It would serve as um, a gymnasium for extended day. Right now, during peak uh, winter sports seasons, we have to bake, borrow, and steal hall space, um, the cafeteria when that's available, um, when the children are forced to stay inside because of, of the weather. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've been getting even less space than we had in the past because with 55 middle school track students running our hallways and corridors, we have even less space than we used to have. So yes, certainly that room could be well utilized after the school day. Um, certainly our senior citizens have become so large that 
um, we can't meet anywhere in the school facility other than the cafeteria. Uh, we once met in the library. Um, our group has become too large for that. We can't meet at the 1226 Shore Road because that has um, a capacity of 49. Um, and our average attendance at meetings is anywhere from 60 to 120 people now. So yes, we certainly would util utilize that space as a multifunction room for them. And if you had that additional space, would you offer additional programming which would generate additional revenues? Definitely. Thank you. And that, that space wouldn't be large enough to have adult aerobics classes, though, would it? I believe it's bigger than Guptill Hall. It is bigger than Guptill Hall? I think so. It's deceiving because the way it's tiered it now, like it's really hard to, uh, at least yeah. unless you have real good visual imaging skills it's uh, but we understand from our preliminary investigations and it would be quite much. it really uh, is pretty good size it really is I asked the janitor who cleaned it how big it really was it's real big <laughs> okay do we have any further board questions on community services one more do you feel that you're reaching saturation point the fact that that what you return to the town has decreased and the fact that your state subsidy is decreasing do you feel and the space available um, I'm not sure that that with what the state is giving us and, and what we're returning to the town necessarily means we've reached our saturation point I think it, it means um, that I'm getting better at predicting what we're going to spend and what we're going to take in um, having a, a large carry forward balance over a period of years comes back to haunt you. Um, I'm, I'm much happier to be able to predict what we're going to spend and, and also predict what we're going to take in and each year work on, on, on what that assumption might be for your annual budget. I think um, in terms of what we're doing in the community, I don't know how much more we can do, um, but we've been offered perhaps a new challenge by um, central office to help um, organize schedule and and facilitate transportation and and, and maybe custodial services as well I, I think that that certainly would be an expansion of our services but I don't know how much more of what we're doing we can do that's my question okay okay good if there are no further board questions uh, I'll ask for uh, questions on community services from the uh, public uh, is there anybody who would like to speak uh, Okay, then this... Uh, Could I just make a comment? Sorry. Go ahead. I, I just, you, you have thanked Sue, but I've done this for four years, and, and this is always just such a pleasure to get this budget, and it is such a bright spot in our town, our community service, and I, I thank you for making my property value go up. I mean, this, this is just a picture-perfect way to offer the needs and serve the needs of the people of the community, and, and nobody does it better than you. And frankly, if you would ever consider running for president, <laughs> <laughs> we can't lose her. I think you've got the qualities that we need, and I would rest a lot better in the evening knowing that we have you. Which party gets her? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Connie. Well, you sort of took the words out of my mouth, except I wasn't thinking about the president. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that on. I just wanted to point out that. Um, it's rare, I guess there's the old maxim that says if you want something done, you ask a busy person. Uh, how I can ask Sue to do more than she's doing uh, strikes me as being sort of uh, illogical, but I am confident that by this time next year, we'll be coming back to you with a um, <coughs> variety of analyses of how we actually are running some of the other related systems that we've been talking about. And I also think it's a measure of our collective confidence in um, what you've accomplished and what we believe you can accomplish that we're even asking you to do it. So uh, I, I just have to tell you from my work in other towns, this is an <laughs> exceptional program and I think people are really quite aware of that. And I hope they are. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Too late. No, go ahead. One more. Right? <laughs> I, I just, Connie, as a follow-up, uh, the fact that uh, the Community Services Program returns 458% return on its dollar 
is um, much because of the work that's done by the people there. And I think that, that what you said is absolutely right. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to a general discussion of the budget. And I'd like to get an idea of uh, how we're going to do this. Uh, who would like to speak uh, to what? I'd just like to take a quick inventory now so we could sort of budget our time and uh, channel uh, the discussion. Connie, what would you like to uh, address perhaps before we start this section? Well, at this point we have uh, finished all of the major components of the budget. Um, I've never, frankly, and this is my 10th budget that I've worked on as a superintendent, um, I've never faced such uh, uncertainties. We not only have uncertainties uh, from the state level at the subsidy level, we are in negotiations as well, which is something that, frankly, is not all that uncommon. But to have the two things together makes it very difficult for me at this point to advise you that you need to go back over this budget and prune or consider or what have you. Furthermore, um, we have yet to meet with the town council, although we did have one meeting, obviously, and got a general feel for that situation. Uh, there are some other uncertainties ahead of us. Um, I think this is a time for you as members of the school board to revisit the issues that you have uh, called to attention, ask questions on, or what have you. Um, the budget as reviewed by the administration is explained by each of the individual uh, administrators is uh, pretty much in your hands at this point. Do you want to speak to any issues tonight? Yeah. Jan? Well, uh, how many and... Uh, well, I have a, a one major one and I have a few just follow-up questions. So maybe 15 or 20 minutes for that, uh, in general, including any public... Uh, if any. <laughs> okay. Jan, how about you? This is just a quick inventory. Yeah, I just want to bring up computers again. Okay. I want to bring up computers, one other subject. Just a few questions. Ten. <laughs> questions. Yeah, would you two change seats and we'll, we'll go <laughs> starting with this end. <laughs> no, I say no. <laughs> uh, okay, the only thing that I want to bring up, and I'll... Uh, take advantage of my possessing the gavel uh, is uh, the subject of how we should uh, deal with the budget on Tuesday night uh, and uh, my uh, my feeling is that we probably should uh, try to schedule a meeting as soon as possible either just with uh, me and my counterpart on the town council uh, or perhaps uh, include the chairman and if we're going, we're going to make it a larger meeting, the, uh, uh, the superintendent and the town manager, uh, to discuss precisely the uncertainties that uh, Connie mentioned and how we should uh, you know, tell them where we are and uh, see where they are and what their thinking is. So uh, that's my one subject uh, at this time. So why don't we start, as I suggested, uh, at this end and we'll move around. Um, I'd like to speak to the integrated arts program at Pine Cove and what I would like to propose is that we cut the staff position um, in integrated arts um, and my reasons are uh, that currently we have two art students um, at Pine Cove. We have the regular art and music curriculum and we have the integrated arts curriculum that brings in visiting artists and um, I think I think we can ill afford to have two, uh, two separate arts programs going on. We don't have two separate math or science or other, other curriculums, and I don't see why we should have two arts curriculums. Um, and also, there, there is widespread concern in the community that we have an awful lot of extras um, in our curriculum at this time, and that um, the kids aren't spending enough time on their um, core subjects. And I've, heard this in a variety of ways. I'm sure this isn't news to any of you either. We heard it at the community dialogue meetings. Um, it's been clear in, in uh, countless conversations I've had with, with parents individually. Um, it's come through in questionnaires uh, that have gone out. Um, and I've also had um, some te teachers say to me privately um, that 
uh, they don't feel they have enough time um, to, to focus on academic subjects. Um, it's also extremely clear that people in this community really value the arts and um, certainly there's a, I don't have in mind um, undercutting the, the arts in any way. I just <clears throat> think we really need to consolidate um, these two programs. Um, so what I'd like to propose is retaining the money uh, that's in the budget for the visiting artists uh, for each grade level um, and transferring that to the art uh, budget. Um, forming a committee immediately uh, to include board members, uh, members, uh, art teachers, um, and interested parents uh, to work to integrate and strengthen our, our arts uh, curriculum and utilize the volunteer coordinator to, um, to tap into the, all the people in the community who are so talented and interested in the arts. Uh, to make sure that it's a really enriched program. Um, I think doing this would demonstrate that we do have a continuing commitment to arts education. Um, it extends uh, the review of the curriculum that we're <coughs> undertaking in, in other areas, specifically language arts and math. Um, it's another uh, tangible step towards forging a, a really meaningful community and school partnership. Um, and we have a very good example of how very well that can work right now going on in the Language Arts Curriculum Committee at, at Pond Cove where we've had uh, not even a half dozen meetings and we're making real progress. So this is not a, a process that I see having to take an enormous amount of time to accomplish. Um, and it would also consolidate the time uh, the kids are are spending on arts education and, and perhaps structure the time better so there's more um, sustained time for academics. Okay, thank you, Ann. Uh, board comment on that? Uh, is uh, that a hand up? No, not there's not a hand thank up. Thank you. Ann, are you suggesting that this be done whether or not the town council accepts the budget as it currently stands? Yes. I, I really feel that we should have one arts curriculum. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me to have two separate arts programs. And are you talking K-8 or K-6 right K now? Currently integrated arts is also in six. No. Excuse yeah. me, I, that's, I'm sorry. K-5. So the, the, the tax savings would be that the position the, the, the tax savings position. would be the would, yes but I see it as a bigger issue than that I see it as part of the general restructuring of the curriculum um, just making sure that, that the curriculum is meeting the needs and where we have two programs there's a lot of time scattered around that is spent on arts education and I would like to see that um, consolidated and have you talked to the principals yes In should we have them speak for themselves, or can you give us? They may, they may like to do that. Since they're here, I would rather not speak for them. Yes. Should we uh, get board comment okay. first, uh, just to uh, keep the thread? But Beth, come on up anyway, because uh, I think you will be next. Um, I just finished with the board <laughs> reactions to Anne's uh, proposal. Charlie? I have had a concern over the years that we seem to, to have two strands and I, have, and I haven't really felt that, that the, the conventional art and music program that are in place have been a part of the total integrated arts programming and, and I feel that once again that this is not a, a, a whole approach or a whole curriculum approach by having two strands. And, and I would like to see it come under one umbrella. Okay, I have one comment. Uh, it's also about two strands, but they're different strands. Uh, over the years, I have uh, received many favorable comments about um, the art program uh, and that type of enrichment. But I have certainly received as many comments, and uh, probably more, 
that we're trying to do too much with too little time. Now, statistically, I could not possibly, you know, validate one or the other. Uh, but uh, those are the two strands that I see. And uh, if it, uh, I'd like to get a little closer to um, some, some uh, analysis of mm -hmm. which one of those arguments has uh, more validity. I think they both have validity. I think it, it perhaps the validity that is valid now and the validity perhaps a few years ago might differ. Um, I think particularly in K through three, I think that this, the staff, there's a feeling amongst the staff um, that the integrated arts have truly been integrated into the, the curriculum. Um, that, the, for example, if a first grade class was doing a theme centered around castles, for example, that integrated the, that the integrated, integrated artist, the uh, visiting artist programs were integrated into the classroom work. Um, I honestly can't say whether at grades four and five that's, whether that's truly the case. I, I don't know. But I think that there is, as, as Anne has mentioned, there is a, there is a uh, perhaps more currently than there has been in the past few years, a call for, for more time given to, to core subjects. Right. Mm -hmm. in, in the integration of, of the classroom material to the integrated arts program, is that also true of of the music and the, just the general art program of the schools, would that also have the same kind of integration into the subject matter? I don't think it has. It's, it's my understanding that it really it hasn't to a great degree historically, but I think that there is opportunity to do that. But I think it would, you know, it would take a different way, I think, of, of looking at the structure of the program, um, a way, a different way of looking at utilizing the artists the visiting artists. Did it also would, I should say, would take some, some planning, some coordination to do that, to accomplish that. Do you feel like a committee being formed immediately and beginning to work on that, it could be implemented by the fall? Oh, I think so. I mean, given, given the, the speed at which the, the uh, language arts has, has progressed, I would say so. I feel as if I'm suddenly chairing a curriculum committee meeting. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask uh, if there's anybody from the public who would like to address this subject. Oh, sorry, did you want to? After the chairman. After the chairman. Is there, how many people would like to speak to the subject of arts? One? One only at this time. Okay. Uh, Jody, why don't you come and sit up here because the... Sorry? About arts. How many people want to speak? Yes, the question is one, <laughs> two, three now we have, and we may have more. Then uh, after Jan has uh, addressed this, unless other board comments, I would ask that you each come forward and sit over there next to the superintendent. And the reason for that is because the camera uh, that can pick you up is over there. So, uh, Jan? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think my, my major concern with this is is losing to the system the person that now does the integrated arts program because I think she is she does an absolutely terrific job and uh, so I if there was some way that that could not happen um, I'd love to hear it um, I, I do have to say though that as far as the two strands I I too agree that I think that it would, be, it would make much more sense to consolidate it and to integrate what we have with the music and the art into the regular program and to allow more time for the core subjects. Okay, in the order in which the hands were raised, uh, Jody Sadaloff uh, first. Peter, as she walks to the mic, may I ask a question? You certainly may. <coughs> Connie, um, the uh, person uh, involved with integrated arts is on contract right now? That's correct. So she would have an opportunity for any position within the system that she's certified for? Well, the, the situation of cutting contractual positions is that 
budget comes into you with recommendations or you may add during the budget process your own recommendations for cutting a position that is separate from the decision when the budget is final what positions have actually been cut then we have contractual provisions for what teacher is affected by that cut and there are specific contract um, steps that we follow so the answer is partially yes but I have not frankly if you then are not prepared to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just say one more thing? Sorry, John. Um, there would also, I mean, there's nothing to prevent prevent her from, from being contracted as a visiting artist or a consultant also. Okay, Jody. Um, am, I, if, am I limited just to um, talking about the integrated arts or if it ties in with one other issue? Can I? I think if the tie-in is uh, okay. passes the uh, what is it the duck test if it if, if it's, it's reasonable, reasonable if it's uh, well you can stop me if it okay. isn't but um, that'd be real tough <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> um, I my name's Jody Sadloff and I'm the parent of a fifth grader a third grader and a kindergartner and um, I am a true believer and a firm supporter of art education in all forms. I think that um, the greater exposure our children have to the arts, the more, uh, the more well-rounded their development will be. I also um, would applaud Gretchen's efforts over the years. I think that her, her uh, creative drama program has enriched to a, an enormous degree our children's education. I also am a firm believer in imbuing our children with a very solid foundation in core curriculum subjects. Um, in a perfect world, all these disciplines would coexist compatibly. In a fiscally troubled environment, they cannot, and that is the situation in which we find ourselves. And it seems to me to be economically irresponsible to um, attempt to maintain two separate arts program particularly, and this is when the other subject comes in, if we're talking about cutting something like the, a single gifted and talented program and still talking about, I realize it's not one against the other, but it's difficult not to tie them in when we're talking about maintaining two um, different arts programs. And I think that the responsible thing to do is to streamline the art and the music and the integrated arts program and to create a truly enriched art program or art and music program that maximizes the talents and the strengths of whatever faculty and staff and artists um, we have available to us to the extent that Gretchen Berg's enormous talents can be utilized I think that's great but I, as I said I think it is fiscally irresponsible to try to maintain two distinct programs um, I also, I, I feel somewhat constrained um, in support of Ann's programs to limit my opinion to, let's say, K through three. I think when we get to the fourth and fifth graders, um, I too have heard many fourth and fifth grade teachers speak out of great frustration that some of them have said they can't find longer than a 35 minute stretch in which to teach writing, for example. I think that's an appalling situation. I mean, the greatest skill with which we can imbue our children for meeting the 21st century is, is the skill in communications. If teachers can't find a period that's not interrupted by what they, they say are special after special after special, I think we have to seriously review our curriculum. And, and so I, I, I think that it needs to be looked at at the fourth and fifth grade level to what extent the arts play um, a role, not to say that it's not significant, but it may be somewhat less significant at that level. Um, and, and as I said, with regard to the gifted and talented program, as long as I'm here and tying it into the arts, I would just like to say um, that I am greatly distressed um, that that position is being eliminated when, now I know the response is there will still be some program for the gifted and talented children, um, but nothing has been articulated yet. Um, there hasn't really even been an attempt to do that. And um, I think that that's something that really needs to be addressed. 
if, as I understand it, gifted and talented, and, and, and I too don't like that name, all our children have gifts and talents, if it does fall under the umbrella of special services, which is how it should be addressed, um, I, I think over the years a, a widely disproportionate amount of resources have been expended on one end of the special services to take care of the needs of children who may not be reaching grade level. This is disproportionate relative to the amount of resources that have expend, been expended to meet the needs of children who require challenges that may be beyond grade level. I think this creates a grave injustice and, and, and equity really needs to be reached. And I just wanted to read um, Beth Henderson at the PCPA meeting today introduced this book that she said she discovered that was so good called The School Smart Parent by Jean Myroff. And I happened to glance at the chapter on um, gifted and talented. And it, if I can just quickly read, they say giftedness should be cultivated. In practice, this should mean that when gifted and talented children enter school, their special nature is recognized. And the school does what it can to stimulate their unusual attributes. Be wary of a school that says it gives no extra attention to the gifted and talented. Parents of such students should expect that the school will offer their children the opportunity to go as far as their abilities will take them. Society has no reservation about spending some $4 million on remedial education for the disadvantaged. In turn, there should be no qualms about extra funds for the gifted. I realize that it's a much smaller percentage of children perhaps that are involved, but I still think that um, it is it is really creating a grave injustice to eliminate a program without first um, coming up with some articulable program that will meet these children's needs and not somewhere along mid-course of next year or in the future, but something that will address them right off the bat. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Um, my name is Tony Williams, and I'm the parent of four children, grades first, third, fifth, and seventh. Um, over the years that my children have been involved in the school, I've had many opportunities to view the school in different perspectives. Um, several years ago, when I became aware of problems not all the way being equal with my children learning to read, and I sought out special services, after much frustration, I found that once the special services teacher got hold of my child, she, in frustration, she told me, I'm sorry that your child hasn't been able to come more often, but there's all these special things going on. She ha I haven't had a chance to have her because there were interruptions in the school schedule so much so that it was interfering with the special services that I had struggled to get for her to have. At that point, I realized that um, the visiting artist, who I've always supported and my kids have always enjoyed, it was becoming a conflict of interest. So before I came this evening, I started thinking back about why they originally started having visiting artists. Um, as I had been checking around with several people, uh, the name Judy Simons came up. She had it must have been at least 10 to 12 years ago or so, was on the school board. And at that time, there was concern that there was so much emphasis on sports that all the afternoon enrichment um, possibilities were always after school. And so that the school board at that time was concerned that the kids were not going to have the opportunity to have enrichment. So the original idea was such that uh, in order for our kids to have enrichment, let's have visiting artists and let's have them come in the assigned segment of art or art and music to include it during the school day in a time allotment that was already there. And then therefore it wasn't going to conflict with after school sports and not being allowed to participate in school activities. So as it looks to me now, the reason why I support keeping visiting artists but keep them in an area that is already assigned to the to the school and keep core curriculum in the classroom um, i also see it as a great opportunity for the art and music teachers that are presently there to be able to interact with visiting artists and have them enrich the classroom 
that, that classroom, the art or the music. And in no way would I ever like to see it disposed of, but I would like to see a higher quality of time put towards the time segment that we allot for the enrichment of arts in the school. Therefore, still balancing the curriculum and being able to integrate our, our visiting artists in those exciting things that they can bring to our school and still having it a part of it without having it being a conflict. Thank you. My name is David Cole. I have two children in the school system, one in first grade and one in fifth grade. And when I was sitting in my office this afternoon, the last place I thought I'd be would be here tonight. But I'm very concerned about the way the curriculum is going, and I think this is symptomatic. The, um, the integrated art system is symptomatic of the problem. I have taken my son to uh, a resource outside of our school system to help him gain the basics. And I, like Ann and, and several other people here, believe uh, very strongly in, in art education and, and its place in our, in our school system. However, I think by having two situations present, I think it's taking too much time out of our uh, children's daily activities in the schools to get the basics. And I think it's time we refocus what we're doing and get back to the basics and spend more time in the math and the reading and the language on a more basic level. Uh, it appears that, that the parents are being put in positions currently to take the basics and teach them at home. And we're allowing our school systems at this point to develop the children in, in those extracurricular ways. I would like the opportunity to take my children and help them develop in those extracurricular ways and leave the basic education to the school systems. And so I feel very strongly that we have our children get more time doing the basic rudimentary work that is required so that they can enjoy those additional extracurricular act things on a different level. But let's keep that form of education, basic in school, and uh, by bringing a more uh, traditional uh, approach into our curriculum, I think our children we would be best served. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, have those uh, three uh, sets of comments stimulated any further input from the public? Uh, Hillary? Come sit up here and... questions to people who probably are in the audience, though. Well, then you can ask them from here, uh, and then they'll join the table. But you have to right. come forward and get on the camera. Otherwise, the microphones don't pick you up, and okay. people can't see who's speaking. Okay. Hello, I'm Hillary Dorsk, and I didn't expect to be here either. I don't understand how much time is actually being spent on the integrated arts. So I hear people complaining, but I don't really have a sense. Is this a weekly thing? Is this a daily thing? Who has the answers to this? I'm not certain I have, have those answers totally. I'm not, I'm not totally familiar with the schedule. Um, but it, it, and it's not a period. It's not as a class. But it, the, when the artists are there, uh, for example, we have a, a person who's working, uh, doing observational drawing right now, and she's working with a particular grade level, and she's working during this particular month on particular days for uh, a period of time. That may be one way that it's accomplished, and there are, there are various and sundry ways in which that's, in which the artists um, involve the children in the integrated arts program. But are we talking about 20 minutes a day or two hours a day? So I don't have a sense of how much time is really being spent. Gretchen's here. I wish, you know, actually, I wish Gretchen would speak because I don't understand what the elimination of this position really means. Because yeah, I've taken it for granted for so long table. that it's going to be there. You could come sit at, at that end. And, <laughs> uh, Nancy, do you? Uh, I guess I would like to know if if Gretchen, who's who's been involved in the positions, feels that we can pick <clears> up the slack and do this. I mean, what, what can she do that we can't do? Well, it's 
<laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I feel like it's a great deal because I have, I mean, I took my children out of private school where I thought the arts were wonderful, and then I came to Cape, and I couldn't <coughs> believe how terrific the things were, and I didn't see the, um, the integrated arts as not being part of my children's learning experience. For example, the, the Odyssey. To this day, when we go on a trip, my children take the Odyssey tapes along with, with us on our family trips, and we, we all read the Odyssey together on some level. If that's not reading and if that's not experiencing core curriculum, I guess I've missed it. For me, it's, it's what makes it have some meaning so that you want to do it and learn it and, and have it be part of who you are. Um, in some ways, I have to say the integrated arts have been much more meaningful to my kids than the actual program of arts and music. And if I could eliminate something, it might be the arts and music program and keep the integrated arts because those are the things that have had some meaning to what's going on in their classrooms. And those have brought in a caliber of, of artists that my children would have been, probably would not have encountered on a one-to-one -one basis. Yes, we could have gone to a performance someplace and, and heard the symphony, which we do. But it would not have been the same, for example, as having Gretchen instruct my children on how to get up on a stage and perform. So maybe I've missed something here, so I, I would like to know what, no, the good what goes on. Um, well, I can tell you some of the timing questions. For instance, when your kids were in first grade and they were studying the Odyssey, um, I worked with all the first grade classes to perform the Odyssey. So every, all the classes each took one section of the book and we, we performed it. That took, um, each kid worked with me about seven hours. Um, so in theater, in general, the way the curriculums worked, I see every kindergarten kid four hours a year. First grade, six to seven hours a year. Um, so then it, ra it sort of raises slowly in order for me to work with every kid. The, the greatest number of hours, for instance, was a sixth grade project, which is equal to around fifth or sixth grade, I would see them eight or nine hours a year to make a piece. And the theater pieces are always directly connected to the curriculum. So for instance, if they're reading the Odyssey, it's not about learning how, yeah. I don't think I could really defend turning people into actors as much as um, it's all about learning about the Odyssey, learning about adjectives, learning about whatever they're learning in a really physical way, and performing their knowledge. So that's what, the, that's what my part of the integrated arts program has always been. And that's the amount of time it's always taken out of their year. Um, the other visiting artists, it's similar. For instance, this year, um, Sue Palfrey's working with the third graders on observational drawing, which is all about it's not actually a drawing skill, it's really a skill about observing and recording. Um, those third graders worked for me, with me this fall to make plays about their curriculum, and again, we worked about seven hours. Um, Sue Palfrey works with them, I think, about six, I think. So that's 13 hours out of their year in integrated arts. And that's pretty true for the grade arts. That's about how many hours it is out of the whole year. But getting back to this basic question of eliminating the position of the integrated arts coordinator, is that what we're talking about? What does the integrated arts coordinator do? That position has been, is already eliminated. That, that is the integrated, I mean, sort of, there was a person working this year who was coordinating integrated arts. Um, my position this year was, I was a half-time faculty person teaching full-time for half the school year, and my job is completely teaching. It had nothing to do with coordination. And what are we talking about for next year eliminating? My position. As teacher. Right. Well, well your, your proposal has more than just te it's teaching half the integrated arts classes, plus um, consulting with grade yeah. level teachers, scheduling artists, um, yeah. assisting that proposal, in writing grants. Yeah. So it is really the a coordinating component. Well, yeah, it's actually, it would be about 10 weeks of teaching and about two weeks of coordinating. That's what that position would be, as a third time position. So it would be about two weeks of working with faculty to organize it, so yeah. It's 10 weeks of teaching, two weeks of organizing. So are we talking in effect about having a drama teacher or an integrated arts person? I'm confused. 
maybe um, one of the ways in which this makes sense, uh, again, coming into the system last year, uh, and, and hearing that term first, I was frankly wondering exactly what it meant too. Uh, the best way I've come to understand it, at least as it was, and although it's shrunk, it has some of the same components. Many schools in Maine have visiting artists. Gretchen is a visiting artist in other school systems. Um, the State Arts Council some years ago began to promote uh, hiring artists for more than a performance. That is hiring them to come in usually for uh, up to 10 days, and that can range over, but usually it's supposed to be a 10-day residency, yeah, it's isn't it? Least 10. Yeah. Uh, and the thinking behind that was to put a genuine artist, uh, not to say that you know uh, teachers aren't artists, but somebody who is in fact an artist and not a teacher in the system, put that person in the classroom uh, in some way other than just having kids go to a performance. That was, I think, the heart of the idea. Obviously, frankly, wherever it's used in the classroom, it's an integration. And although the degree of integration arguably may be more or less depending on the skill of the classroom teacher or the match or what the thing may be, it's truly really a, a basis an artist in residence program, which has been quite popular in a number of main schools. In fact, I would say the majority of main schools that I'm familiar with do subscribe in some way to the artist in residence program. Um, I think the thing that was in the CAPE system was that the CAPE had chosen to have one and a half positions, one full-time position, one half-year position, full-time half-year, of their own artists who were full-time residents for that period of time. Um, Mary Jo Thompson, who was also a coordinator, taught some poetry in the classroom. She taught some other uh, language arts kinds of things, and last year she was also teaching uh, one section of Gifted and Talented. Uh, but in essence, the program was two staff positions, one full, one half, who were Cape Elizabeth artists and residents, plus the town also has funded, as other school districts do, through the state or through the contacts that individual teachers have in a variety of ways, the artists and residents program. Now, the proposal that is was brought to the board was one where Gretchen's time was cut back, but she was still partially that artist in residence of, with a contract position with, with a school district, <coughs> where she agreed to do some time in coordination because we had cut the position of the aide this year who was trying to, to do that. Uh, but largely, at this point, that's a scheduling issue. Um, and some monies in the budget to continue to hire artists to come in. And we do, in fact, have now a fairly, I think, as I understand it, a fairly wide range of people who come in, who have, the teachers know them, they know when they might use them, and so on. Um, as I understand Ann's proposal, I don't know exactly what it would play out in numbers, but it would leave some of that money there. But rather than start trying to shrink both sides of that budget, it would cut the staff position, although, if I understand this proposal correctly, uh, the system would continue, hopefully, to contract with Gretchen as a visiting artist. Is that what, what I heard you say? Yeah, but my, my proposal is to retain that money, uh, the, the $1,500 per grade level, um, for visiting artists. So that could but consolidate that can be it in with the, the in, art and music that we right. have. And basically and, ske and, and hopefully schedule, schedule it during art and music time. And, and can I say a couple other things? Sure. I, mean, I was just saying. I, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the S. I mean, those are the impressions that I've gained of this in my year and a half here in the system. And if I'm, I'm, nope, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat <laughs> in the same position because I don't know all the background either. But that's the way I have learned to think of it. Something else that might might help clarify the time business because it, the time that the the, inter, the artist is there will will vary. For example, Odds Bodkins is going to be there for a more condensed period of time and working. Um, with a number of different grade levels. Some artists are working with one single grade level over a longer period of time, so it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, uh, to say how much time that is, but I'm, I'm guessing that Gretchen's estimate of somewhere in the range of maybe 700 hours uh, totally is 
totally you're correct. It's just that it's spread out. Can I yeah. say just a, a couple other things? Um, you mentioned Odd, Odd Spodkins, and obviously that, that was an outstanding program and an example of what, what can be very right about an integrated arts program. And again, I just have to point out that there is nothing to prevent us from hiring Odd Spodkins to, to do this kind of thing um, under this proposal. Um, and another thing, um, aside from the hours directly um, performing the place, don't they don't the the uh, different classes also go and uh, and watch the plays? I mean, yeah, they're not so it's not only performing time, but it's also uh, observing other classes performing their plays. Yeah, I guess it's six. It's about seven days a year. Classes are invited to come to a show that lasts about 20 minutes. So seven times 20 minutes is about the amount of time you're um, for watching a performance. Right, but real realistically, it's not only the performance time; it's the gearing up for the performance time, the going back after the performance time. So realistically, in terms of distraction um, from regular classroom activity, it's it's probably a longer period than that. Yeah, it's actually not all the students either. It's probably three times a year per student. Okay. Three times that happens. Would anybody else like to uh, participate in this uh, informal roundtable? <laughs> There's still one room, or one <laughs> spot over there. You'll have to bring your own chair. Nancy. Um, can I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it depends on the chair. Right here. Well, you can sit there for a minute. Today, uh, Beth and I had an opportunity to meet with the um, fourth and fifth grade team leaders and to talk about some of the concerns that parents had addressed and uh, some board members had addressed in regard to integrated arts. And it seems that the teachers would again articulate some of the concerns that have been raised by board in regard to the amount of time that they have for core instruction with youngsters. That isn't to say that they don't value very, very much the arts programming that we've had and uh, been offering our students over the last probably 10 years and in, with intensity. But they saw uh, the proposal to look at the amount of time and try to incorporate it into the existing allied arts schedule as a more workable and more um, valuable time for them so that they could spend spend what they needed to on core subjects. Uh, I really felt it was important that, that the board understand that staff, that we have spoken with staff and that they concur. Uh, that, would that be your assessment yes. of, of the uh, feedback? I think it's particularly, it's particularly through four and five, um, because That's as right. I think it was Joni that pointed out that uh, their, their time, for example, for, for language arts is very limited, mm -hmm. or it's split up with splinters. That's right. For example, when we look at um, the uh, Art of Black Dance company coming in, that is a tremendously powerful um, and rich experience for our young children. The difficulty is they contract with us for a specific amount of time, which is one week. So that you need, it, the difficulty is we take six classes and we have to expose the six classes to opportunities with that dance troupe with intensity throughout for one full week. So when you talk about the amount of time, it's really tough to pin down uh, to say, we specifically spend X amount of time in a school day with, with our artists, uh, it, it's, very, it's very tough to do. We, we can contract, for example, with a Georgian uh, Cool or a Susan Webster or uh, Sue Palfrey. We used to have Mimi Carpenter last year, Oz Watkins, but they're all at different times throughout the day that, that youngsters go and work with these, these specialists. So it's, it's, it is tough to, mm -hmm. to imagine. I have a question for you. Um, integrated arts is certainly one thing that takes away from time for the core <coughs> program. What about uh, between now and the fall, are you going to be looking at 
all of the other kinds of things that are offered in the school that also take away from core learning time and make adjustments. I mean, this has come up because of budget, but there must be other things too that, that need to be looked at. I might ask you to be specific, if you could, uh, to kind of identify what it, what it is specifically you're speaking about. Uh, before we move to that, today I also had opportunity to talk with the fifth grade teachers who wanted to be sure that you had feedback on the working relationship with the band and chorus. If you remember, we came to you in the fall and asked would that be moved to uh, a, a before school instructional time. That has worked very, very well. I received a memo from both Tony Boffa and Rebecca Wing who said that there has been no uh, attrition from the program. There have been no youngsters to their knowledge who have literally dropped out for either a, a transportation problems or a conflict of schedule or whatever. They felt that was working very well. The fifth grade teachers brought my attention to that today because uh, they were concerned about the scheduling for next year. They're anxious about the possibility that, that band, of course, may be phased back into their school day, and that was a specific question that they had. And we will be looking at that and looking at ways that they can tap longer, longer periods of instructional time for core subjects. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what specifically you're referring to, if you're referring to a DARE program or, or yeah. what, I don't Things know. Things like that. And just from the Language Arts Committee, hearing teachers from those grade levels saying, you know, they're kind of, they're being interrupted frequently right. during their la language arts block. I, they, they weren't specific, and, and I didn't okay. ask at that I point see. as to, you know, what it was, but... Um, uh, I think Connie spoke at one point, or at least it was in passing, reminding us that we are a large, we are a fairly large system now. When you look at eight sections in a grade level, shared faculty, shared facilities, that puts constraints on scheduling and our resources. So what ends up ends up happening, prime instructional time has to be shared. It makes it very, very tough. We may say, yes, we'd like to absolutely protect as we did. In the old days, we used to protect certain amounts of time in the morning. We, we were very rigid and we would say, from 8.30 to 10.30 is core instructional time and nothing shall touch that. We, we would be Sounds able. good to me. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> However, when you have early start up in one building, shared faculty, shared um, space, it gets very, very tough and, and it's not possible any longer to do that. I guess that's one of my questions through this budget process. Is there anything that's not in the budget that, that needs to be there? As you're talking about shared staffing mm -hmm. um, that could contribute to, to giving you your 8.30 to 10.30 block. I mean, that, that to me is a real big issue for next year. Well, that's that's true, true Jean. Um, what compounds that difficulty is the uncertainty of alignment, for example, of grade levels. If we're talking about um, shared faculty, we, were, we shared in the middle school complex this year, we shared four, eight faculty were literally shared. Now, if the fourth grade moves to the K-3 complex, and I'm not sure this is the time for us to get into all of this, but if the, fact, if the four, fourth grade moves and the kindergarten moves, that compounds our concern in terms of how do we provide the same kind of programming for kids who may possibly, possibly be on different schedules using the same faculty who will now be in literally three different buildings. So that's going to be a puzzle piece that we're really working, beginning to work with, and hopefully next week on the 11th, when we begin the transition team, we can start looking at those chunks. Of I would point out that we, part of that $200,000 piece that I broke into chunks and explained to you, I had some pieces in there for splinter programs, you may recall. Uh, that is because I can't possibly uh, imagine some of our specials leapfrogging through three buildings. Um, so that we obviously need some provision for that, and that's where it is. Okay, uh, we have to keep moving, Beth. Just, just one more point, I think, for clarification. I think it's, and, and Nancy, maybe you can help me with this, or Gretchen, uh, the number of integrated, uh, 
Hollywood integrated. What the number of visiting artists that we have per year is that? Uh, I would. I'm guessing, if my memory serves me right, it's about six or seven. Is that correct? At the moment, it's um, an experience with Gretchen. They all all the grade levels, with the exception of fourth grade mm -hmm. this year, have had uh, Gretchen's program and one other visiting artist. Uh, that's as well as um, any opportunities that we've had. We've plugged in full school. For example, the Odd Spotskins experience. Uh, full school will hear part of his performance. The ABDM, we will be sharing um, third, fourth, and fifth will attend part of their performance. But the ABDM experience is basically a fourth grade experience, and the odds is the resident artist for fifth grade. I don't know if that answers the question or not. But these aren't the only things either. There are other right. uh, programs that are funded through the PCPA, the Perry Alley right. Theater. Perry Alley was, Theater. theater um, the visiting language. author was funded through the PCPA. I mean, there are other, um, you know, they may not come specifically under integrated arts, but other special experiences and visiting um, people. And I, I just have to say, um, you know, we focused a little bit on fourth and fifth grade. Um, and their, their lack of academic time, but it, it's also true in K-3. I mean, they, the, the kids have, um, you know, art, music, gym, uh, media center, Thomas Memorial Library, um, sometimes some guidance programs. I don't know how, um, mm -hmm. how structured those are right now. Um, and, and there's just a whole range of things that adds up to a lot of time away from academics. And it's not that any one of these programs isn't laudatory on its, on its own merit, but we just have um, terminal overload here, I think, on um, uh, what we're trying to do in a given day. Are you, are you saying, like, when Nancy mentioned about the, the um, <coughs> African Dance Company had to come, you know, for a period of a week, if we, if we send the message and say it has to be accomplished through art and music, through the times that art and music are scheduled, is that then saying no longer bring that company here because it doesn't fit into that? I, I don't think that's a, I think that's a decision that should um, be made through that committee. I mean, I think it all has to be looked at. There, of course, there are going to be special experiences that are worth doing no matter what. Um, but I think they should be in the context of a plan and, a, and, and some objectives. Um, and I think that's a good question for... Okay, well, let's decide how we're going to take this forward, uh, you know, as part of the budget process. Uh, and it's, it's always a difficult one when you mix uh, curriculum with uh, a budget with this many variables. But uh, I guess my uh, reaction would be that uh, uh, it might be appropriate to uh, discuss it when we discuss the budget on Tuesday night. Sure. And uh, a... Uh, that you could introduce a, uh, you know, a motion accompanied by a, a plan, some analysis, uh, spend the time between now and then and touching a few more bases or developing some more information. I don't know if that's something that you want to do, but uh, uh, Loretta. Are you getting it together Saturday morning? No. Okay. I have it on my calendar for some reason. Uh, yes, it's on the calendar. We're going to discuss it. That was just one vote you heard. All right. Yes. Uh, but, uh, I, I think there are a couple of others. To Tuesday, and I was thinking that we kind of Although I guess, I guess I, perhaps I spoke uh, quickly. Uh, if we had a lot of uh, complicated subjects like this, we might well <coughs> uh, deal with them on a uh, on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Can I just mention one just one budget sure. tidbit? Was that when we when we set this proposal? And at $1,500 per grade level, that would bring in one visiting artist for half of the grade level. So if the hope is that they're, whatever the format is, if the hope that every child would have any, any kind of experience, I think that figure would have to be at least doubled. It was mm -hmm. thought of as half of that grade level being serviced. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Sorry, well, I thought you were pointing at, uh, come forward, please, and sit at one of the empty chairs. You could sit here if you wish, and I'll just move this up. People feel, I feel like we've got people pinned in the corner oh, when they get to I want to. I'm Charlotte Howard, and I wanted to ask a question of Ian. You just referred to um, 
other activities as um, you know the, the artists that come in and everything mm -hmm. in that I noticed that you included the Pond Cove Media Center no yes, that's I, something they do outside the classroom right but I really feel that that's part of the curriculum just because it gives the children so much they learn so many skills there I work there as a volunteer and um, I've never been exposed to a media center before and when I work there I see children who begin by coming in and just looking around and listening to the stories going on and we have wonderful staff who are storytellers but they have one other thing that they contribute to the children they're very user friendly the children can come in and they always have time for them they it doesn't matter what child is interested in if they don't know what they want to read they spend the time looking around with them they talk to them they show them books they ask what they like for activities what they like for sports and they're always willing to work with the children I've seen adults stand and wait for them to be spoken to and they take care of the children first I feel that the children from the beginning of the year to about halfway through the year learn to select books they learn to stamp their own books. They learn to read card files, which I was never taught in school. And by the end of a few years, they can do their own research. And I've watched these children, and they have taught me things that I don't know. And I think that's a learning experience for them. And I don't think it can be done in the public, school, public library, because I think that they could never have the time to sit down with all those children and do what's done there. The other thing is, I have a fourth grader, as I said before. I just have a love for the lower grades of watching the children learn. And I feel that when the fourth graders go up into the media center at the middle school, it is much easier for them to walk into that media center, which is, well, it's more like the, going into the public library. They are treated friendly, but they are really pretty much on their own to find their way around. And I think that this should be considered part of the curriculum, the media center, that it should not be considered an outside activity. And I've had many children tell me on the playground that they feel really comfortable, they can go in there and people will smile at them and they always ask them immediately what they need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now let's uh, take another mini inventory here. You want to talk about computers? Well, I just, I just, yeah, basically. Okay, I want to talk about uh, where we go from here. Charlie, you've got a few questions. I just have general, general questions, questions all over the place. Okay, Loretta? <laughs> okay. Then we'll, uh, we'll start with, you can choose. No, it's computers. Oh, computers. <laughs> I'm confused, too. I just wasn't willing to admit it. Uh, computers. Okay. I still, I, I understand that we can't have a plan now. <laughs> um, I still am concerned. I think that we need the computers. I liked Rosemary's idea the last time of, you know, the way we could go about getting even more than what's in the budget. But I still am so uneasy about that amount of money and without knowing how it's going to be integrated with having apples and IBMs, which is like apples and oranges in some ways, I guess. I, I just am uneasy about voting for it and hoping that it will happen later. Okay, I, I've given some thought to that. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, well. I wish you would have spoken first. <laughs> No, I, I'd say all the same things you would. I, I'm not so uncomfortable approving a large amount of money because I think this is uh, vitally important and I think we're pretty far behind. Uh, but I wouldn't be willing to spend the money without a good report. So we can put $50,000 or $150,000, but if there's not a good analysis that shows how much we'd be spending over a period of time, we won't spend, I would propose that we don't spend a penny of it. That's a good second idea. 
no surety, no ticky, or no ticky, well, no surety. Well, I think maybe I, I think you need to talk to Frank again. Um, he is, after all, the one who's brought in the bulk of the specific requests. He did give you some indication of what the high school requests are coming from. Maybe uh, he can help explain it further. Frank. Um, I support your, your notion that you don't spend a penny until you have a good plan. And I propose to bring you that plan. I, I admit I don't have the elaborate detailed plan that either you might like or I might like at the moment. I think we have very good reason to request the computers in that I think we have the need. We are currently talking with about four different people who have uh, some interesting visions about computers. And what we are trying to do as a result of those conversations, which we expect to conclude in the, in the next couple of weeks, is draw up a plan um, that you, in a sense, suggested at the hearing last week that involve also the library, as well as the current Graphic Arts, uh, Arts, Graphic Arts Center. Um, we're concerned not only about the, the, the kind of computers that we buy and the mix of the computers that we have, um, but we're also concerned that the technology that we buy today is something that we can keep using uh, that we can predict a, a lifespan for that com for that computer that uh, I don't know whether 10 years is going to be appropriate or not, but it seems to me that it well might be. That, that uh, if we get, uh, I think we can count on the fact that whatever kind of computer we buy, five years from now will be out of date in one sense or another. That's sort of been the lifespan of the technology. I mean, you can argue that it's six months, but I think that from a public school's point of view, you got to look at five years. Right. Are there but, four people that you're talking to, four people in the system? No, four system? people outside of the system. Uh, Main Center for Computer Service, uh, for Educational Services, uh, John Lunt, uh, some people at Brown that are connected with IBM. Uh, I want to talk with some, some uh, I think Pam Rawson's got another contact that we need to talk to, and I want to talk to somebody uh, at Unum, if I can, who's uh, got some, some ideas about networks. I just think there's, there's some good expertise around here, and one of the issues is really networks. And that's okay, an so interesting way to compound the abilities of your computers as well as improve the interconnectedness of them. And so um, your plan will, and I'll recognize you in just a second, will be K-12 and will No, I, I, that's an interesting. I, K-12 <laughs> will take longer than two weeks. Tell me weeks. what the plan ought to be. Well, I'll tell you what I, I think the plan ought to be. All right, see, I, I too think that we ought to have one K-12. K-12. Plus administrators and anything else that's out okay. there. Right. That, that, that will take longer than two weeks. Yes, but I, but yes. I think that, that, you know, that that's the way we ought to go because I think that the part of the computer literacy thing that I, that, that I mentioned last week, the issue of computer literacy, is, is really a K-12 issue. And I think at all grade levels, what we want to begin to do is have the computer become a tool and not the object of attention. It will be initially an object of play and attention, and I think that's important because I think that that can be very creative. But it needs to be two, two weeks. Is I mean, forget two weeks. I, I think two weeks is ridiculous. If, if anybody talking. could produce this, to my satisfaction, in two months. So well, I think we need. I think yeah, we need to. Sure. I think we need to pr produce it by the by the middle of the summer so that we can purchase the equipment. Right. Okay. I mean, I think there's an imperative. <laughs> no. Go ahead. Um, are, are we looking at any other school systems that are, that are that have gone a little farther in computerizing? It seems to me, I mean, business is great and they have a lot to add, but I would think there's some school systems that are far, or way farther ahead than we are. I'm sure, I'm sure there are, and and um, we we um, ought to do that. I think we have talked with one school system, neighboring school system, that is conceptually um, far farther ahead than we are, and they are. They have slightly better hardware, um, but they too are trying to do this um, um, in, in sequence and uh, and buy it. But we will make every effort to, to look at other schools. I think that some of the better school use of computers is perhaps not in state but out of state. Okay. Out of state. So does everybody agree that that's the uh, the mandate? It's system wide. It's uh, do we agree on system wide? I don't. <coughs> Come forward, join the table. Okay. <coughs> Is this, uh,
that you yeah. wanted to address? Okay. I just have a question because the middle school did have a request for two computers um, that are designated for a special education area. And specifically, we had asked for two MAC LCs. And the reason is they have more capacity to do the things that we need for those special education students. So I guess in a way, we kind of feel like we have a plan for just two. Um, and we really need them. Would you like to see me beg? <laughs> I, 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 I don't have an exact percentage, but a large number of our special education students um, do have difficulty in written language. And oftentimes, by the time they get to the middle school, it is recommended that they work on a computer. We have them. They're in the lab it would be much more expedient for us to have one in each one of our special education areas. So we'd really like to have those two. Your turn, Rosemary. Peter, I will have to say that I think that the budget is a policy statement. I think we have just asked Frank uh, or whoever will serve on this com committee to do an impossible task because I don't think we've really given him a charge and to say, here, create a plan, to me, I would say, <coughs> well, what do you want in it? And okay. what is your purpose and what is your scope? And I think in all fairness to people who serve on committees, even if we have to do it under item 9B, new business on Tuesday and think about it over the weekend. Well, there certainly has to be an outline. I agree with you 100%. But I mean, I uh, think we should this provide. Is, this is all shorthand. Yes, we have to say, I mean, my rough outline would be, uh, we'll approve as much money as seems reasonable based on what you've roughed out so far, you know, mm -hmm. the two of you right here at the table and uh, whoever else has requests for in computers. But, uh, and I think that a lot of the issues have been uh, mentioned, the integration of the systems, that this uh, procurement is part of a three to five year plan that goes somewhere, that we're not just ending up with a lot of freestanding computers, a lot of different pieces of software on shelves, uh, that, that uh, we've looked at uh, networking, file servers, and everything else that's out there. And that's got to be down, in, in my view, in some sort of a piece of paper. That's a wonderful case you just made right. for because two I, computers. For, for two computers. But and I, I agree for the others in having a plan. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I guess I'm concerned because we really need those two computers and, and those two have a very definite direction and purpose. Um, if I was sitting here and our proposal had included 25 computers, I would absolutely take the same charge. That, but but that the problem is that, that you get two LCs and then sometime later somebody else gets two, uh, two SIs and somebody else gets an IBM. and. All of a sudden, we have a whole lot of computers that are slightly different, using slightly different software. I don't think that's a good outcome. Uh, are, are the needs in, in special ed though specific enough that we can address those needs? I mean, that's a, well, I mean, that's a direct look, um, student-related thing. I, I, I totally understand what you're saying, but can we somehow carve out maybe a, a tiny exception for special ed? Well, I, I think yes. The answer to that, in my view, is yes. But nevertheless, uh, we do have quite a few months before we have to actually place these orders. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I got a computer the other day <clears throat> through an 800 number, practically, uh, in 48 hours. It's not as if computers are hard to find, that you have to put in an order in March in order to get one in September. Uh, we do have to put one in in July to get one by September because we get a very good price break that you may or may not get through your 800 number, although you get very good price breaks on the 800 number. You get, well, th that's another. We'll, we'll also try to get the best price. We, I think we have plenty of time but, but I, I think to do this right. I think we have time to certainly make the, the first um, um, step in this direction and do it right. And yeah. I, but I think that, that the, the requests for something like special ed and for that particular computer in that particular use okay. is, is something that, that um, will fit the plan as well as be an exception that needs to be made at, at this point in time. And Rosemary's right. There should be a clear mandate and let's put it on the agenda for Tuesday. You can add it under budget. Let's. Uh, <laughs> That's an idea. It's on there. <laughs> Have a computer finance committee, and I really, I really think that this has to be also thought into what the curriculum is. Yeah. 
Now there's a curriculum issue, you have curriculum issues, and we have in, in the four, five, six, seventh, and eighth, a computer learning curriculum. And none of this is coordinated. And, and it goes along with the type of computers. We have all these different types of computers out there, but the kids are learning on, on something antiquated and old and that has no application. Well, well but I, I, I would uh, suggest that, that this is planned, it has been planned, and that what's going on in sixth, seventh, and eighth, and, and, and in fourth and fifth grades has been thought out. It was thought out uh, a number of years ago, and it's time to rethink it. That's what I mean. And I think that, but I want to defend what's being done to the extent of saying I don't think it's been a, a, a curriculum without thought and planning. I think what has happened is that in each of the last year or two, we have begun to rethink other parts of the curriculum. And, and they are impinging on our use of computers and our computer curriculum. Um, it's a good time for us. It's a good opportunity for us to rethink it. That's what I mean. There, there's this, this splintering of planning, and it's not coordinated. And it may be time to rethink the piece that's in place. OK, I think we. Uh are in general agreement on computers, aren't we? I have one other yeah. question on computers. Um, in the high school, do you have a stipendary position? Yes. Do you know what that cost is? I'm trying to just find out. I think it's something on the order of $1,000. There's a little bit There's a man in the audience that wants to speak. Somebody would like to speak to computers. Come join us at the table. Hi, I'm Andy Tabor. Um, on, the, on the subject of computers, I'm a little concerned with the direction I see a lot of the discussion going in terms of concern about the diversity of systems. I think one of the uh, things that I see in the school system that is probably uh, of concern to me at times is that there isn't enough diversity of the systems that are out there. Um, people give a lot of thought to wanting to have uniformity of the systems, but I think what's more important is in this case, as an example, you have an application. I think you need to look at it from the application level, what you want to do with the computer, not what the computer looks like or how it works, but what you want the students to be able to do. If there's a special application, a specific thing you want to do with the systems, it's more important that you uh, select the application and then pick the best hardware that that uh, system will run on. In this uh, day and age, you can pretty much network any two pieces of hardware together effectively. It's very simple to do. We do it in business all the time. Um, I think probably the, uh, the last thing you, you really need to concern yourself with is having uniform hardware across the structure. In fact, with networking in the state of the art that it, that it is today, a lot of this older hardware can simply be networked to communicate to some of the newer hardware, and it's not obsolete at all. You, know, you can continue to use hardware well past its obsolescence point just by putting some type of, type of an emulation package that allows it to communicate to a more modern uh, computer system. Good, I think that's a very fair point. There's no doubt that uh, uh, those uh, those systems <coughs> exist, and as I mentioned at the last meeting, my, my new Apple PowerBook reads MS-DOS, and mm -hmm. it's no problem. Uh, but I'd like to know precisely before we place this order, uh, and you're on the right track, what is the application? Who's going to be using what? How many hours is it going to be used? By whom? Uh, what are we, what is our long range plan? And hardware, software, and, and networking are all part of that. And, you know, your point, well taken. There, there may well be a perfect justification for uh, the hardware and software proposals that you have in your budget. There it is. <laughs> but it, but it, needs, it, it, it needs to be tied in with the other schools okay. and with, with uh, the next three or four years. I'll Anybody else on computers? Uh, Tim? <coughs> this is a reprise of the meeting we had two a week ago. Well, I had a couple <laughs> of questions, I, I, and they're purely questions. But do we have a computer? Have, have we had feedback from a computer club? Do we have a computer club? Have they had an opportunity to input uh, on your proposals we, for we what you like? We do not have a computer club in the district that I know of in the high school. We may have in the middle school, but I don't know in the high school. 
of being such computers, but we have, we have a lot of students who use computers. Have we had any input or feedback from community services as to what their <coughs> thoughts as far as computer education and training in the for not only the school age uh, population but the other citizens of the of the town has sue had any input in sue, sue and i have not talked about computer education for adults no. see this is a critical issue for me in my with my kids i want my kids to have that available and feel good about it and have fun with it and at the same time i want it to be something that is economical and our tax dollars are spent very well uh, and, and my thinking on this is, why don't we have Sue Weatherby do it? Because we'd probably turn a profit. <laughs> but <laughs> but my, my thinking is that uh, you, you, uh, you need to start somewhere in whether there's a well laid out plan or not. I think if we got some computers in the system that were available, Sue would probably have classes at night, be charging fees, and uh, be returning a, a return on our, that hardware being available in the, in the town. So I, I think, Students need to have an opportunity to give us input because there are a lot of there are a lot of kids out there that can whiz bang these computers already uh, on their home computers, and I think the community services could give us some some great thought and ideas on how they could utilize uh, those that uh, hardware and software. And I think there's a couple of things that we might want to encourage some input. Thank you. Well, anybody who would like to volunteer to participate in this process uh, that has any particular knowledge and has some ta time available, I think we might form a computer club of, uh, of adults to assist in this process. I am sure that out there in this community there are a lot of people that are very knowledgeable. Come forward. I'd be happy to have them call me and serve as a contact point for that. And Sue and I talk frequently, we will talk computers, and I know that my community service does offer computer training. That's great. We have not yet uh, had a long discussion. Paul, Frank, sir, can I ask him a question on something else? You certainly may. You don't have anything budgeted for any kind of educational development uh, like summer work for your staff, correct? Um, there, are, there is some, some uh, money in for summer work for some staff, yes, and, and I think that we will probably be trying to use some of the grant money that we have in the of the Central Schools for some summer work. Um, but yes, we do have some. Okay. I just, it wasn't where everybody else's was, so I could it not. It should be in um, the uh, 8925 accounts. Well, actually, <coughs> it's under instruction. Yeah, it's in the summary of instruction. It's $7,200. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I would like to try to wrap this up by 10 o'clock tonight, but I can always pass the gavel to somebody else if uh, we don't make it. I do have to leave at 10. Uh, how many, uh, you have a list of questions, don't you, Rosemary? Uh, well, I have a list of revisits that I would like um, included in the discussion under 9B on Tuesday's meeting, if possible. And that is um, the reduction of the life skills uh, health position, the reduction of the gift and talented position, uh, the um, increasing of the um, nursing uh, staff at the middle school with an explanation of what our duties are. Um, I'd like a discussion of short-term notes for borrowing for computers for uh, uh, the work that needs to be done at the high school, the handicapped accessibility issues, the uh, multi-purpose room conversion, the playground, and the other issues that you will get a list uh, together on what is the capital expense that's in our budget. Um, and I would like uh, to know if the chairman of the finance committee will have an opportunity to talk to the finance chair of the town council before Tuesday to get a feel for the uh, percentage of increase. Yeah, I certainly, uh, that, that's, uh, well, let's take the first part of what you said. It would, is it the consensus of the board that those be added to the agenda and be discussed Tuesday night? I... Well, they, they don't have to be added to the agenda. They just have to be dis discussed on the item number 9B. Right, added to the discussion on Tuesday mm -hmm. night. Is there, there's, no, I don't have a problem. I think that's fine. Anybody I, else? I think we need a public, um, 
hearing-ish on some of these issues that people who went to PCPA might have heard about today. There are, mm -hmm. there are people who don't really know when it's when to, time. When to come forward. Right. And yeah. I think okay. they're used to school board meetings, and that would be a perfect mm -hmm. opportunity. Um, so we are going to have a number of things, I, I take it, yeah, like integrated arts and some other things. Um, would it be appropriate, I'm just asking as a new board member, <laughs> I really don't know, um, for Rosemary maybe to submit some written comments to people so we can think about them? I, I'd be happy to do that about um, well, my, I think my it, issue. It, I mean, it, it certainly doesn't forestall discussion, which we should have. Um, I'd be happy to write it up. It's, I'm not going to shut my computer off all day tomorrow. <laughs> Either of them. Probably more efficient to leave them on anyway. It's probably better for them. Well, I'm not going to take the risk. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, uh, that, that's fine with me, too. I think if you can uh, generate some uh, information on that by the same token, are you planning to do the same thing? Uh, uh, yeah, I'd be happy yeah, to do so, that. So I think anybody who has uh, that can get information into other board members' hands, uh, so they'll have some time to reflect on it. That would be uh, useful if there are motions that they're going to make or intend to make. Uh, that would be useful. Well, I'll mail mine Friday night on my way out of town. So if you don't have them Saturday, you'll definitely have them by Monday. Okay, okay. good. Um, Charlie? Mine are just informational so that I can make a better decision. I need to know the number of kids in the 6th through 8th um, gifted and talented program that are being serviced, the number of kids, the children, our kids, students. children, students. Wait a minute, before we get on to this is collection of, of information, yeah. um, uh, that's a pretty long list there. No, they, I, these aren't all those. These are, I just have a couple. Oh, okay. Good. okay. Some of them have been addressed. I want to reserve about Some of them been addressed five minutes by, before okay. I have to leave. Uh, I, I, this is from my memory, so I will double check for you tomorrow, but I believe it's a total of 34. I believe there are 16 students in sixth grade, 14 in seventh grade, and four in eighth grade currently. All being serviced under that 32,000, oh wait a minute, no, no, that, under $26,889. It's a six tenths position okay. um, staffed by um, four-tenths by Marty Watts and two-tenths by Hope Brown this year. Okay. And we had 30-something serviced in fourth, fourth and fifth this year by a full-time teacher. One of, one of the things that's different, though, that I should mention is um, our gifted and talented programs in the middle school are entirely devoted to the humanities. The mathematics component, which is also covered um, in the gifted and talented program in four or five. In the middle school, we have covered by having a sixth grade transition math class, which has 19 students in it. And then also some cross grade level placement. We have two sixth graders who participate in an eighth grade algebra class. We have, let's see, seven um, seventh grade students who participate in eighth grade algebra. We have two seventh graders participating in geometry and we have four eighth graders participating in geometry classes. So our mathematics strand, um, we have done with cross grade level grouping and some special offerings within grade levels. Um, that is a program that's also part of um, the four or five position. Okay. So what Hope and Marty do is essentially the, the humanities part the, it's, of it. It's the humanities part, correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's talk about the process the rest of the way uh, before I have to leave, since I have to execute a lot of this process, if, if I may. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it, it would be my uh, intention to call the chairman of the uh, Finance Committee of the Town Council tomorrow morning and suggest a meeting to uh, post her on where we are and to discuss specifically the whether or not the board should try to approve the budget as we normally would have on Tuesday night. Now, just to remind you of the schedule, we would do that and then nothing would happen until our meetings on, uh, I believe they're March 26th and April 2nd, where we would have joint school board town council meetings to discuss that approved budget. Uh, the argument against approving the budget 
on Tuesday night is that we have these uncertainties. Uh, the meeting that I uh, might have with uh, the chairman of the Finance Committee of the Town Council could be enlarged, as I mentioned earlier, to include the two chairmen of the bodies and uh, the town manager and the superintendent. And I would just leave that to the discretion of, uh, of, uh, of Janet, Janet McLaughlin. So is that, uh, does that sound reasonable to the board? And how do you feel about going ahead and trying to adopt a budget uh, on Tuesday night based on what we now know, for or against? I'm, I feel the responsibility of the school board is to present a budget to the town council that we have diligently tried to peer down to the most uh, economically uh, feasible uh, amount without hurting educational programming. That is not the chore of the town council. The town council's chore is to keep the tax rate lower. I would feel much better about my vote if I uh, saw the town council receiving. Furthermore, I don't think that the chairman of either body can commit either body. Uh, oh no, there's no commitment. To, it's a discussion. Anything. Um, and Absolutely I would, not. I would hate to um, try to get to a zero budget increase uh, to the detriment of educational programming if we can prove beyond any reasonable doubt that an increase, however slight, or a decrease, if appropriate, um, is uh, necessary for the operation of schools. I feel at this point, although I went into the budget meeting as a school board member saying I will not support an increase in uh, our request to the town council, I will not go in with a uh, request for an increase in um, the, the mill rate. I have changed my position uh, because I am convinced that uh, we need more money than we had last year uh, and I can uh, circle five line items that attribute uh, to 100% of that increase of $203,000. Um, my concern is if we make a cut um, or if we don't make a cut and the town council pairs us down to a certain level uh, then we might not have made the same choices. And specifically, I'm talking about a request for a bond. Um, I have uh, some ideas about spreading out the debt, as I've mentioned before, uh, which could eliminate some cuts that we would have to make if we haven't heard from the uh, town council whether or not they will approve uh, the, uh, the short-term borrowing. And I think that that's critical. And I do think there has to be a joint school board town council meeting on those issues before the town council should be in a position to make a decision about how much money we can have. But uh, on the specific subject, uh, I, I don't, are you for trying to approve a, a budget on Tuesday <coughs> or against it? Are you inclined for or against? I am not inclined uh, to give them the budget that we have uh, as our working paper. Okay, Loretta? I think we need more time. Charlie? I concur with what Ruth Mayer says. Jan? Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't want to vote yet. Same. Okay. So we are, uh, that's what I will uh, inform uh, uh, the finance chair of the town council that we uh, feel we need more time in view of the uncertainties. Uh, I take it the superintendent concurs, finds that. Uh, well, if, if it wasn't for the subsidy issue, I would certainly feel that, that we could at least go through the uh, first line adoption and not knowing that it might have to be uh, adjusted. Uh, with the subsidy situation, I mean, there was an article in you know, yesterday's paper, uh, supposedly, you know, the Appropriations Committee has decided to put all these proposed cuts back in. Um, our budget, from a subsidy line point of view, is going to waffle back and forth to the tune of about $150,000. Everything we've discussed here tonight could well be absorbed in that kind of money, uh, plus other issues. Uh, and I think that for you to have to, um, we don't have a lot of time. We are going to have to make some decisions, like, and I'm sure every other district that has subsidy coming into them is going to have exactly the same problem. But what we have done at this point is administratively to give you a budget with, with our shot at where we think uh, we are, what we need to have. Some of it admittedly is stuff that we can uh, be clearer about, but frankly given at this point in a budget, I'm concerned about having some provisions for things that uh, we can work on down the road. 
uh, but we can respond to your need for more precision and I think that's very reasonable. Um, I, I, I don't think it does any harm to adopt a budget. I simply think that I would hate to see you go through the pairing process and every budget I've ever put together there is a pairing process and it's usually um, when you get to about the point where you are right now. Uh, each of you has a particular interest. Some of you are warmer on one issue than another and you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, to go through that process, make some decisions and then find that we either have to lose more money or might, you know, possibly get more money. Uh, I think it's too early. Okay. Yeah. Can I just say one thing? Um, I, I just want to make the, the point that even with all the money in the world, some of the things we're talking about are, are right or wrong for other reasons besides yeah. money. Okay. I hear you, and I understand that, but at the same time, some of them are money decisions, or at least some of them are tied to priorities that if the money goes, uh, you'll make okay. But we really have a good plan to tell. I mean, if we didn't have the $200,000 to make the uh, kindergarten appropriate space, I mean, we'd be at zero. Absolutely, yes. I mean, you said five things. Or if our state aid. Right? No, it's one thing, it's the move. Yeah, and it's a one-time expense, sure. and, and, and that's sure. why I, I mean, well, I've softened my position. Well, the move is 2%, but then the, you have an additional 2%, which is absorbing the cut that we've already received this year to the subsidy. So the effect, as you go through that cover sheet, obviously, is that uh, even if we would brought in a totally flat budget, we'd have had a 2% increase in the tax rate. And the reality is that that's what's happened. We, we also don't have a very large contingency in case we have a, a problem of some sort. So. And we also haven't made much uh, progress on negotiations because we really just started the process and we're going to be working very hard on that in the next And this days, budget so. does not give us much leeway, so uh, that's doesn't. another issue. I mean, you have to be, you know, when you go into a budget session with negotiations, um, you put you try to deal with that in some responsible way, but I, this is certainly the tightest budget I've ever put together. May I have the last word? <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Okay, everything from here on is informal. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's it. No, 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 I have.